Appreciate you guys showing up to the re-entry show. I know it's been a while since I've been able to come back and talk to you. I've got one of my favorite people in the world that I get to spend some time with. His name is Rick Speck. He's in Michigan. He's one of the you know the people I've met while I've been doing the work at the ACLU. And you know, one of the things that struck me, um, you know, when we first met, is some of the, the some of the same struggles that we deal with in policy work he was dealing with in his personal life. So I felt like it was very important for us as we talk about re-entry, as we talk about folks coming home in droves as a result of COVID. Like, you know, what is the quality of freedom um, that we're trying to search for and what are we really advocating for when we talk about re-entry? So I'm not gonna steal his thunder. Let me introduce you guys to Rick Speck. How you doing, Brother Richard? Hey, how you doing? Um... Rick Speck, Metro Detroit area. Um, you know, served multiple terms of incarceration, um, spanning most of my adult life over 18 and a half years. Uh, the last term I served was a 15 year sentence. And I've been home this May, uh, coming up on seven years. And, you know, coming home from the state system, then the federal system, um, and then again, the state system this last time, the big difference for me this time was is what had happened in prison helped me change my thinking. But because of that change, I had support that the first two times I came home, I didn't have um, from my family. Um, you know, my, my younger siblings were now all adults. You know, it's 15 years later. And, you know, they were able to offer me um, all the resources I need. All, all my basic needs were being met. And that was something that was different for me from the first two times I came home. Um, my basic needs weren't met. So, so let's pause there for a minute. So when you say your basic needs, and let's go back to the first time you came home, because I think some folks don't understand that there's a difference between the state system and the federal system. Um, but I'm glad you kind of honed in on the support you needed when you came home. So the first time you came home, what was some of the support um, planks that you needed from your family and from the community? Well, I think probably what I needed most at that time, um, because I came home to a correction center for 90 days um, and then got my own place. You know, I worked was on Tether. And even having housing at that time, um, even though that was good, I, it was, you know, with a woman that I didn't know so well, even though we were having a child. So you know, from the outside looking in, it looked like safe and, and stable housing, but the reality was, is I was in a relationship and, and had never been in a healthy relationship. So, you know, that that in itself brought um, more difficulties, right? And um, I don't think that enough folks understand the importance of, of two things outside of food, uh, shelter and clothing, right? Um, our basic needs about relationships mm. and in relationships with of, uh, of the romantic type right but also relationships with our families relationships with our community um those things aren't talked about those things aren't stressed there's not a lot of value put on those things and what i can tell you is from my experiences coming home then and and now has been I had relationships, I had mentors, and, and uh, I sought that out because I understood how important it was to have mentors. And even like you said, when we met, you know, I was going through some things, um, both in my professional career as well as my my personal life. You know, I suffered the loss of a child, um, and you were there, right? So you you became a mentor um, as well. And and now here it is years later, and we're still in connection, right? Um, even though I left the ACLU for another um, position doing policy work here in Michigan, um, the beauty is I still have many of those relationships, you know, um, and that's huge for me. To me, that's a game changer. It really is because, you know, and I came home, I didn't have a Rick, right? I didn't have someone who has successfully or was successfully navigating life after prison. Uh, and trying to stay out of prison. So, you know, I think it's important for us to kind of suss out, right? What 
are some of the peer-to-peer -peer tactics that you have found successful? Well, you know, I was fortunate to co-found a nonprofit that does direct service um, to our community, right? To brothers and sisters of the numbers coming home. And so for me, I was blessed to be able to work with guys just like myself. And what we did was, is we looked at what were the things that were barriers and hindrances. And for us, a lot of times when um, getting direct services, what do they want from you? They want you to come into their office. Sounds rather simple, but how simple is it? For a person that went in as a juvenile or you know, 18, 19, 20, still very young, to navigate public transportation, to navigate you know, getting rides, a bicycle, all these, it, it sounds simple, but it's not, it's not. And, and, and it causes people anxiety, right? And so what we did was, is our initial touch with clients, we went to them. Hmm. Our, our folks went to them, you know, picked them up. Maybe we'd go to a Coney or, you know, a fast food joint, grab some coffee what, and, and just chop it up away from the home. Because a lot of times some of these placements may actually be what they need to talk about you know, some of the struggles they're having in their siblings' home, in their parents' home, heck, even in their wives' home, you know, that where they came home and the wives maintained this home and family and, and they're the new component. And, and how do they fit into that? Well, you got to take them away from that so that they, they have this free-flowing, you know, conversation with folks. And I think for us, when we were able to share that we faced many of the same struggles, People are more open then because they're not worried about being judged because we're, we're the same folks. I'm from that community, unfortunately, right? Like <laughs> I've been a part of it most of my adult life, but that also is a built-in trust factor. And so you mentioned the relationship with your family and how this last time was much different than the first time. So if you have to contrast those two, right, what was um, the difference between the first time you went in and the level of support and this last time and the quality of support? Well, I, you know, a lot of my supports on when I came home this last time, they were kids. They were in junior high. Um, which was my, my siblings. Um, so I didn't have that. And, and I think, you know, with um, my parents, you know, as much as they wanted me to do well and succeed, I think there was a question, and rightfully so, in the back of their mind, would I? And the reality is, is when my mom asked me when I came home, is that it, you know, promise me you won't go back? I, I couldn't promise her that. What I said was, I'm I'm gonna try not to. Because they're I not came always. Home this last time I made that promise. Right. I made that promise. I said, you know what? I can look you in the eyes and I can tell you I'm not going back. I promise that. And it's seven years later and it gets easier and easier every day, but I'm not going back. And, but it, it, and it's not because I don't think we wanted to go back the first time. We just didn't know how not to go back. Right. Um, yeah, that's problem solving skills. You know, I, I'm not embarrassed uh, to tell people because the story needs to be told. You know, there was times where I almost lost my home. Mm. Um, you know, and I went, I, I served this last 15 year sentence for impersonating a DA agent and robbing drug houses. So then I come home to legalize marijuana and more money on the streets than I'd ever seen. And when times got tough, I'd lie to say that the thought had, didn't enter, but it only entered briefly. And it was a fleeting moment and it was gone because I understand today I can solve you know, the problem of finance through a whole bunch of different ways other than drugs or armed robbery or any of those things because I, I understand I'm capable and I was designed to do more. What about those people that don't have that same well, with all, you know, and I came home, you know, because I had a, a a violent conviction, McDonald's wouldn't hire me, right? And so I had to immediately become an entrepreneur, right? What kind of help, what kind of support systems 
can we begin to implement as a community to make sure that we're offboarding people from prison and onboarding them into our communities in a healthy way? You know, one, one program I've seen or, or one place I've seen it done being pretty well was in Washington, D.C. Um, with the Office of Returned Citizens Affairs. Hmm. So here's a dedicated department for, for Washington, D.C., just to our affairs that um, is headed up by a formerly incarcerated individual who is staffed by, uh, with the exception, I think, of, of one of their folks, their director of operations, you know, all their outreach workers, their case managers, all formerly incarcerated. And, you know, and this person sits on the cabinet with the mayor. So it's, I mean, it's legit, legit, right? It's well-funded. And they're there helping to solve these problems of employment, um, discriminatory practices, housing, and some of their policies actually have some bite to them to where if they don't, if they are um, discriminating based on that conviction, um, you know, they can be fined and, and a large part of that fine will actually go to the person, uh, the returned citizen who was denied that opportunity. So, you know, when I look at places like that, I mean, think if, if there was in every major city or, or across our country, those kind of hubs, because all these resources and, and challenges and barriers are different from one community to the other, from the inner city to the suburbs to the rural. There's transportation difficulties in all three areas, but they all look much different, right? So solutions are gonna be different. Um, but imagine if we, you know, we have this big fanfare of sending folks away with this court process and all, how do we bring them back? You know, the big part for me was getting involved in my community and having mentors that, that got me involved in the community, you know, working on, um, I mean, I remember volunteering on campaigns. You know, that wasn't anything that I had ever thought I would do, much less make a career out of it at, at one point, you know. Um, but it was it was people like um, you know that that I'll give a shout out to today, Adrian Tanone, Rico Razzo, guys that work for the city of Detroit. There were mentors that helped us, that made these introductions, that helped open doors that might not otherwise have happened, right? Um, but it was because we were willing to go out there and and meet and network and tell our story and, and figure out how we fit in. But it was through mentorship. It was through getting involved in that very community that we harmed and wanting to do good again, wanting to give back. So on the policy side of it and on the operation side of it, how much onus should the Department of Corrections bear on providing true reentry preparation in terms of not just a little six week course before you get out, but actually begin implementing um, that process three years prior? No, I think they own a, a great onus of that. The, a good portion of that is the responsibility because that's literally what they're tasked with. And, and as I said, for me, you know, I was trained in a certain set of skills to become a mediator and a peacekeeper in prison through a, a nonprofit that was doing voluntary work in there. And we built that out. We built that out to our own housing unit. You know, we built that out to have a no violent incidents, critical incidents in our housing unit for two years. But it was through this new skill set, but we were teaching it to general population, but we were living it. And so I was able to live to a higher standard with ethics to know what integrity really is mm. and what that meant. And, and be a role model in this. And so we, we changed the culture. Like I was surrounded by a group of men that were just phenomenal leaders in all the wrong ways that when honed in the right way. I mean, we, we were 25 men on a 1200 man compound and we were making change. And using that influence, right? Like using, because we felt good. And when I look today at all those men that, you know, I worked with, for all those years and we lived it out, we practiced what we preach. They're all doing so well in their communities and giving so much and adding value. And I look at it like we had the largest budget of all the groups, right? 
from the prisoner benefit fund. It was like $2,000, right? Like we were able to affect that kind of change <laughs> on the inside with two grand. And we can't do it with 200 grand on the outside, right? They got like 152 million here in Michigan earmarked on our budget for re-entry. And I'm scratching my head thinking 152 million. How can we have the problems we have? So now we got to find out where this 152 million is going and help to get it to go into the right places. I think you touched on something important um, that I want to unpack. And what you said was a nonprofit brought you guys in a model and then you guys built that model out and then you guys were given a budget. So what that sounds like to me is that when formerly incarcerated people are resourced and they are given a model, we're able to implement that model in a successful way that necessarily that, that kind of um, calculus isn't happening in, in the free world, right? So as we think about moving forward and as we think about reducing recidivism, what would you say to county officials? What would you say to government officials in terms of allocating funds to organizations that are run by formerly incarcerated people? Or justice impacted people? For, I mean, I'm a firm believer that education is the great leveler. And by that, I mean, whether it's a trade whether it's training and entrepreneurship to fulfill the dream and idea that a person has, or post-secondary education to help folks get where, where they want. Um, I think a lot of times that the department, they want us, even when, when I did the direct services, um, they want us to find somebody a job, mm. but not a career. Why aren't we more career minded? Like, I understand I needed a job too when I came home and I had the same problem you did. Unfortunately, I had, you know, seven felony convictions. The last ones, last three were all of, of a violent nature, you know? Um, and so I, I had a skill that I could paint houses and buildings. And so I had to do that. And I lived on my L grant money, you know, <laughs> A uh, student loan. I, I, I was enrolled in community college because I was going to do better, be better. Um, I, I wanted to find the best version of myself. Mm. And I knew that was through education. I knew I had a trade that I could rely on. But it, that was the great equalizer was education was when I did have an opportunity to get to the table. That I could talk about it in a way um, that made sense both to them and to my community and to me. Because sometimes it's not quite so simple. I, I, you know, we did this exercise where you have somebody close their eyes and imagine what their day was like and how they woke up and what it was like when their feet touched the slippers and then they went downstairs and they got coffee. And then I asked them to experience a day of what somebody coming home experiences when they're in commercial placement or when they're in their family's home and they feel like a stranger. I remember I had 90 days to go and I got all these feelings of excitement and trepidation and fear. And, and I'm talking to one of my best friends and he's in the bathroom at his parents' house and he's crying and he's saying, Rick, I, I don't know these people. Mm. They don't know me. And he served 19 years from, you know, from the age of a juvenile. And that's scary. Right. And, and he's not living in, you know, he's living in a good home with people that cared about him, but the reality was is he just didn't know them. And they didn't know him, right? And Not at all. Yeah, that was something I dealt with. And, I, and as we're butting up against our time, you know, and I came home from prison, you know, I had left my parents' house at 18. And, you know, one of the requirements of being released from prison was going to their home. So I was back in my parents' home at the age of 31, right? And um, the person that they knew at 18 wasn't the person that came home from prison. He was somebody totally different. And I struggled with them, even with myself, right? Trying to, 
navigate not being who I was, showing who I could be, but also kind of, you know, explaining to them life isn't the same. I don't have the same options. Like I can't just go apply for a job like you can. I got to do some explanation, some explaining. And that explaining often leads to me being precluded for, from an opportunity, right? So as we're closing, um, how can folks get in touch with you? And um, what kind of parting thoughts do you have for folks specifically coming home from prison? Well, they can get in touch with me. Um, I, I always put my phone number out there. I put it on the internet. It don't bother me at all. 586-388-0054. You can email me on my personal email, R-I-C-K-S-P-E-C-K 21 at gmail.com. Um, and you know, for folks coming home, the one thing I guess I could I would say is, is don't give up that hope and hope and don't lose that faith because so many folks have came home before you. Mm. Worse struggles, worse struggles, sometimes less struggles. But we're all here as a community and 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 we can make it together, right? I, I know that if people reach out to you, just like I have, you're gonna answer the call, just like me. And just like so many other men and women just like us spread out all over this country. What I know is, is when I get the call, my wife, you know, God bless her, is so understanding. She knows, right? Like, this is my passion. This is, this is my calling. And it doesn't always happen at the most opportune times. Absolutely. But what I would say is, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to talk to folks, to let folks know how you're feeling. I've worked with folks from one year to 42 years of incarceration right? 42 years. And what he needed more than anything was somebody to listen to him. Somebody to know that those fears that he had of not fitting in aren't just his, but were all of ours. And to one degree or another, we all experienced it. And to one degree or another, we all overcame it. And so don't, don't lose that faith. Don't feel like you're the only one that doesn't have because we all haven't had, but that there's a whole community out here and that if you reach out, I have that much faith in my community that they're gonna answer that call. Thank you, Brother Rick. I think that's very powerful. You know, I think that was a transformational thing in my life was when I was able to talk to some folks that had been through what I was going through um, and I didn't feel judged. I didn't feel like they didn't understand. And oftentimes when you talk to a quote unquote civilian, um, you feel like you're trying to explain to them a situation that they can't quite wrap their minds around. It's kind of like a woman explaining to us, you know, uh, uh, contractions, you know, we see it happening, but we can't imagine the pain, right? So anyway, thank you so much, Rick. Thank you folks for, for tuning in to the re-entry show. We're gonna do this more often. You know, we're calling this set of the, of the conversations, conversations, uh, talking to experts, people who have, are successfully navigating re-entry, but folks that can give us some real information that's gonna enable us to help people that we're organizing to help, people that we're advocating for, and also people who are coming home from prison. So make sure you reach out. If you haven't done so already, subscribe, like, share this video with somebody that you think um, might be uh, moved by it, could, could get some value out of it. And also folks who uh, can possibly hook up with Rick too. All right, you guys have an amazing rest of your day. Appreciate you so much. Have a good one.